for discuss uh, women's empowerment and all these topics. First, we need to know what, what's the meaning of environmental sustainability, meaning that we have uh, all our uh, participation, like economic and social development plans, need to keep it in a balance regarding to our natural resources, uh, such like water, soil, ocean, uh, and any natural resources that we have. So we need to keep this balance uh, in the environment as it. Uh, women's empowerment. Women's, we need to focus on the structural and social change that need to uh, occur in order for women to have their equal rights, equal opportunities to, uh, to let them reach their goals to have their freedom, uh, to to use the the the, uh, the best tools, uh, so they can help their families, help their communities, uh, help themselves also through the empowerment program. Uh, regarding to uh, we we'll back to the sustainability first. Uh, the, there is there is a three bottom line. There is a three. Uh, three main P's for uh, for sustainability. Uh, in sustainability, we always focusing on the first part, which is we are we are we don't have another planet. We have only one planet, our Earth. So our Earth environmental performance, how it looks like uh, through uh, through, uh, through human activities and and environment itself. Uh, the the second part is people social performance. How, how our social contribution uh, affect on the planet and affect on the profit. That the third part for sustainability is economic performance. Uh, how it looks like uh, the economic benefits and the profit. So the three parts they are they are uh, they are they are collaborate to to we are trying to find a way to keep the sustainability in between of all of these uh, three, three pieces. Okay, sustainable development. When we are talking about sustainable development, we means we have a three Bs. Here in our uh, in our presentation, we need to focus on two B. The first one is people, and today people we mean women and girl here. So end poverty and hunger in all forms and ensure uh, dignity, equality of life, and equality in uh, uh, in, in, in in sustainability also. And the planet, we need to keep and protect our planet, natural resources, uh, and the climate for future generation, and keep it as it. So, uh, as as a global, as all of you, uh, all of you, you know that we are uh, now we are facing many of the global challenges in a, in a different uh, in a different ways. Uh, one of the main uh, it's belong to climate change, global warming, and all this uh, stuff. Uh, clean water in some communities, uh, increase in a population and the lack of resources, um, um, rich and poor gap between education and learning, health issue, uh, peace and conflict, uh, the role of women in all these communities, um, energy and using efficiency energy and renewable energy, uh, science and technology. So this is a main global challenge that facing all the community and all the governments worldwide. And women uh, on the number eleven, as as um, as in the presentation, women is coming on number eleven based on the priority for each part. Here, what's how we can turn the sustainable development goals to support and to empower women? Uh, so we have, as as we as we said before, we have seventeen goals for sustainable development. Uh, women coming on uh, on. Uh, uh, Seven, seven of them. There is a there is a part of women. There is a part for gender equality uh, in the center of the SDG. Uh, and for sure, if it's not achieved, the implementation for all the goals uh, will not getting an acceptable uh, result at the end. Uh, at the end of uh, to 20, 2030. So uh, regarding to the SDG, uh, eleven women have equal rights in the city to. To have sustainable, to have sustainable rights and sustainable uh, living, living lifestyle, and she can play uh, uh, girls, women and girls. They can play a central role 
uh, in management, uh, management for food, management for water, uh, management for uh, energy using and, and consumption. Uh, because, you know, women, they are everywhere. They are at house, they are at work, uh, they are uh, in the community and women, they have, women, they have uh, a child, uh, they have families, uh, they have friends. And so they, they can promote the message of, of sustainability or the sustainable development. It's easier than, uh, uh, than men based on the studies. So they can share, they can uh, be a part of it, uh, even, even through the social media, the participation for girls and women uh, through this kind of initiatives uh, more, than, more than men. So we can at least, uh, we can use this uh, collaboration and uh, initiative which is coming from our men uh, to, uh, to host it for this kind of, uh, of event. So how does gender uh, matter for us? Uh, environmental degradation, as as you know, yeah. Uh, for for environmental, uh, the screen is still the same, yeah, yeah. Environmental degradation and the climate change, uh, which is different from from area to area, from country to country, from uh, from place to place, uh, based uh, based on many uh, on many categories or based on many criteria. And uh, here, uh, population, uh, population for being towards uh, poorest people, uh, and you know, women. Based on that, they are seventy percent are women. So women, they are suffering from uh, uh, bad life, we can say, or from poor poor life. So they are keep searching for work in uh, uh, in a non development countries. They always uh, searching for. Uh, and for fine food, for fine water, uh, for their families and the, and the children. So women make uh, make up 60% of the workforce in the climate sensitive substance farming, the agriculture industry. In some countries and in some places, women they are uh, they are the uh, they are care about their families and they are. Uh, they are a part of uh, the main part uh, for their families and for their children. So they are keep searching for work. They are keep searching for uh, to to uh, to raise the level of, of their families uh, based on that. So uh, how does gender matter? We continue on that. Women have less access than men to education, to credit, uh, to political participation. Uh, to family to be one of a family planning uh, in information and technology uh, land rights and diverse income generation opportunities so all these challenges it's a part of uh, it's like obstacles for women because as you know all of us women uh, they are facing not, not not all women they can they can continue their education level not all of them they have um, they have the right to 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 get a job uh, not all of them they have a right to to, to have uh, their own land. So they all these obstacles, and we can find this uh, this a challenge in our communities. Uh, there is there is a lot of a lot of uh, ladies they 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 don't have this uh, this right in their life. Uh, and you know uh, if there is a disaster, if it's like, like a natural disaster, or is there is a a, a problem regarding to climate change. Uh, there is the, the the violence against women increased during these cases. Uh, so women always under pressure. Uh, so we're trying to pull women up and let women to show up their their uh, capacity, their their capabilities, uh, to show it to their communities because they can do a lot and they can make a difference in their in their communities. Um, integrate gender issue into uh, so how we can um, be uh, the first part to um, to let women play a vital role in sustainable development and in clean energy uh, we need to show up the role of women it's wrong integrate gender issue into policy, uh, policies on climate change adaptation and mitigation so we need to have like a gender action plan 
uh, through this action plan, uh, through this policy, we can show up the, the role of women, promote gender equality in national crisis response and recovery act, encourage gender sensitive financial planning. We can, if there is, if there is ladies and they have uh, special or sustainable ideas, we can find uh, a, a, a sponsors or a sustainable. Uh, 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 sustainable uh, sponsors for or co-founders for uh, for this kind of initiative. Uh, support active participation of women's organization in environmental programming. Develop gender indicators and inclusion of gender uh, data. It's like the programs relating to waste management. How women can uh, can be a part of waste management plan for the government itself. And we're not talking about a small scale for a moment. We need to, we need to talk uh, larger and larger. And what's the, the big part that women can do through the, the big, the, through the government and the, and the policy itself. Uh, natural resources, climate change, and green entrepreneurship. And this kind, the, the last point, green, uh, now most of uh, leaders in, in our community, and this is like a, uh, now it's like a trend. Most of them they have their uh, green business, uh, green business like um, a green um, a green product. She's she's selling or she has a green product, or she's she do uh, a compost at their homes and she then she sell uh, fertilizer um, uh, using the food waste. Um, she she has a solar panels and she try she's. Uh, installing and fixing uh, so we have one minute yeah if we can wrap up within uh, yeah. the time frame thank you okay yeah uh, so uh, to, to move to move faster on this uh, so the challenge that women face that uh, we need to to have more women on board of director in investment on renewable energy uh, uh, to increase the participation uh, of women uh why why women uh, why women is more i need just to uh, to move forward uh, uh why we need to increase the awareness for women because pollution affects everyone but affect women and the child uh, the most so it causes a lot of problems and disease on uh, on women uh, and women and the children so if, if we are using, if we understand the rules as a change agent to go for energy uh, transition sectors. So what we need to focus on that women, women tend to be more sustainable consumers than, uh, than men. They are more likely to buy uh, equal label products. They, are, they pay more attention to green uh, recruitment. They attach more importance to energy efficiency, transport and fuels. Uh, they are more willing to change their behaviors and their attitudes through their communities uh, to achieve that sustainable or to have their sustainable lifestyle. Uh, so what's the role that women can, can, uh, can achieve uh, through this diagram? So women, she is a leader, she's entrepreneurs, She's employee, she's a client, and at the end, she's a part of the community, and she's one of the community. If we build uh, education level and learning level for each part and uh, empower women uh, through uh, through these categories, we can uh, we can at the end of the day achieve the sustainable development goals. Because as we mentioned earlier, that woman she has uh, she has a huge part in achieving the the SDG in general. Uh, through, through clean tech technology, as you, as you know, uh, the renewable energy sources, there is a solar, uh, hydro, geothermal, biomass, and wind. And uh, woman, she's um, um, it based, based on the studies and based on the, um, uh, the reports, the annual reports uh, relating to IRINA, uh, there is 35% of workforce in renewable energy, they are men and uh, 35%. So, uh, so this number it's uh, it's not enough, but but it's good it's good to start and good to know this number that women they are uh, they are working in this in this kind of job because you know women uh, usually they like to work on uh, administrative jobs uh, with the person forty five percent more than uh, the other technical job. Uh, like uh, like this, like uh, for a steam job, like science and technology job, uh, around twenty eight percent, 
and non uh, non technical job 35 and for administrative job uh, 45 percent so now women they are 35 percent of women they are working on renewable energy sector and which is actually our we, we hope to increase these numbers day by day uh, so we need at the end, uh, to, to conclude it, we need to invest in girls and women uh, to, uh, to, 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 um, to keep our, our, to achieve our sustainable uh, development uh, goals, to find a job satisfaction for women, uh, to, uh, to raise uh, the performance for the organizational uh, through empowerment uh, and also uh, through educational levels. So building awareness, it changes our attitudes and it creates habits. This is going to be a part for uh, empowering women and let women play uh, play her role in the community as well. So thank you so much. And uh, I, I think I'm done right now. Thank you, Dr. Eva. I've learned a lot today. Correlation between uh, clean uh, tech energy and women participation, uh, being a stakeholder. It's amazing to learn about all these all this information. Uh, I think we have one uh, question, uh, which was um, from uh, Bebe. Uh, she says, or he says, it, is it possible to receive the slide of presentation? Um, and they provided their email addresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, for me, it's okay. And, and it's, it's, it's belong to you, to you as an organizer. Great. If we have no more questions, maybe I can uh, start uh, also presenting. Um, if one of the, um, the organizers can give me access to for sharing, uh -huh. that'd be great. Dr. Ahmed, Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Ahmed, I'm Dr. Amal Amin. Dr. Ahmed. Yes. Yes, Dr. Ahmed, you have a question? Is... No, uh, stop sharing. Ah, okay. Dr. Ahmed, stop sharing, please, the screen. Um, I believe uh, the sharing is uh, from Dr. Heba. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm done. Yeah. Great. So uh, then uh, I will go ahead and do the sharing also from my side. And perfect. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about adopting um, green building principles to create livable, inclusive, and resilient cities. I'm Basim Abdrahman. Like I said, I'm the founder and CEO of KESK. KESK is the first initiative, the first company in Iraq that was established to introduce green building um, services and solutions. I have a master's degree in structural engineering from the US and I'm a lead accredited professional by the US Green Building Council. What is sustainability? Um, by definition, sustainability means the ability to meet the needs of the present without compromising future generations. What is a green building? A green building is a high performance building um, specifically designed and built to reduce the overall negative impact on human health and the natural environment by minimizing resource, consum resource consumption like energy, water, land, and materials, and also to reduce waste slash pollution. So Dr. Hiba talked to us about the SDGs, the green building uh, principles address, uh, the SDG uh, number uh, seven, I believe, it's for clean energy and also 11 for sustainable cities and communities. So what went wrong? in the way we are developing um, our buildings and communities. Buildings ha that has been poorly designed, they are affecting the health of, of the tenants because we human being, we spend 90% or more of our time indoor. So if the building is poorly designed, not enough ventilation, 
um, the poor design, this is going to be reflected into uh, so many different issues like mold, like uh, wrong kind of materials that has been used with chemical um, uh, chemicals being emitted into the atmosphere is going to affect the health of the tenant. So it's going to affect our health, it's going to affect our productivity as well. What also went wrong is that the way we are building and expanding our cities in a non-sustainable manner, it created what we call, what we can see here, what we call the heat island uh, effect. The heat island effect is when we replace uh, green spaces and natural surface of earth with uh, asphalt, concrete, or block. So when going to replace the natural surface into these uh, surfaces, the, um, the sunlight, and instead of being um, reflected back to the atmosphere, is going to be absorbed by these surfaces, by the surfaces. Uh, asphalt, concrete, and, and block. And then it's going to be emitted again to the atmosphere, creating a heat island effect where the temperature inside the city is always no less than three degrees Celsius higher than the suburbs of the city. So we need to control this because this is going to affect the health um, uh, of, of people and also the economy in the long run. Also, the way we are um, uh, building our cities, we are also uh, the replacement of green uh, land with, um, with concrete and asphalt is going to reduce the absorption, the absorption of, of, um, of uh, rainwater, for example. So it's going to create a, a, um, a runoff effect where the water that's coming um, from the sky when it's raining, it cannot be absorbed because the, the, the surface that we have has an absorption rate of less than 10% compared to 80 to 100% for the natural surface. So it's going to create the, the issue of flooding and also is going to pollute our water um, resources uh, because the water that is going to run off the cities of these streets and, and um, and also these, uh, uh, all the different surfaces is going to go back uh, to, to the river, uh, cleaning off every kind of pollutants of the cities and putting it back into the river that we're going to use and consume eventually. Also the way we are building our cities, we are uh, not taking into consideration the um, uh, light pollution we're creating. Um, and uh, on the top of all of that, the economical uh, issue that I'm going to explain on how the poor design and construction of building is going to be reflected um, into loss of money. So the economical environmental problems created by conventional building is that the energy cost, I'm going to talk about Iraq specifically, the energy uh, loss cost around $6 billion annually. That's basically uh, between uh, the fact that our buildings are poorly insulated. So 80% of the energy we're losing. It's just basically like we're leaving our windows and doors open all the time. So none of the energy that we are using to heat and cool our um, buildings are preserved. Also, um, conventional buildings cause the loss of sales and rental premiums, uh, which is around 7% that are typically earned by green building. So if you are going to create a green building, basically you can rent it or sell it with a higher price and it's no less than 7% from 7% uh, above. Also the daily water consumption in Iraq is double uh, per capita, is double the international standards. And uh, less than 1% of the Iraqi waste is diverted for recycling. So we need to make sure we are uh, using green building principles when we're designing. So it means that we're generating less waste per uh, um, um, square meter. The social problems uh, uh, in Iraq is that um, the energy um, supply is less than 50% uh, of, of uh, the demand. 
Um, this picture is of an Iraqi child that was spread over the summer, last summer, and it uh, drew public rage. Um, also, uh, the lack of uh, electricity supply from uh, the public sector um, is uh, causing that people have to pay most of their um, electricity uh, expenditure for private generators, and they're very expensive and highly polluting as well. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of people protesting every summer because of lack of electricity services and conventional buildings, um, according to our data and, and our energy analysis reports, uh, are causing energy loss that's uh, um, no less than 80%, and it's increased the uh, strain on local utility infrastructure. So through the building, uh, green building uh, principles, uh, and rating system, we can uh, achieve a 25,000 um, average uh, annual energy saving per building. Depends on the size of the uh, size of the building, of course, but we'll also take in consideration the cost of uh, private generator costs, not just the subsidized um, electricity from government. Um, also, we can achieve uh, 400 um, a cubic meter, um, uh, average uh, cubic meter of um, water saving per building per year. Um, we talked about the increase in sales and rental premiums that are typically earned by green, build, uh, by green buildings. And also, we can save uh, 3,000, uh, an average of 3,000 kilograms per square meter of CO2 emission uh, per building per year. Uh, and uh, of course, this is going to be reflected into saving um, um, any kind of cost associated to health problems that can be around um, 130 US dollar per uh, square meter uh, for each building. Um, people are going to say green buildings are, can be more expensive. Yes, that's true. Um, the sustainable features that uh, provided by green buildings can be expensive, but this is not how we calculate the total cost of a building. There is a concept we call life cycle uh, perspective. A life cycle cost is basically design and construction uh, cost plus the operation and maintenance cost. This is how we need to think as engineers, as developers, as government, when we want to to uh, to design and build a project, not just think of the initial cost that is merely design and construction. So, green building assessment tools exist uh, because uh, we need to evaluate the sustainability of existing buildings and to verify they comply with national and international regulations. So not any designer can say their buildings are green. They have to follow international tools and these tools can decide if their buildings are actually green or just a conventional building. So these are a selected ass assessment tools. BREEAM is the um, British or the, uh, uh, the, the system that used by the UK. Um, there is a Stidama in UAE. HQE uh, in France, I believe. LEED is the American uh, rating system by the US uh, Green Building Council. Um, and there are so many different other rating systems. I, I'm just showing you a few examples of them. Uh, since I am a LEED accredited professional, and this is the rating system that I use uh, for my projects, um, LEED is basically uh, is leadership in energy and environmental design. It is a third party certification program developed by the United States Green Building Council. And um, there are around 94,000 projects across the globe that has been certified in 165 countries, um, covering 2.4 million square feet of LEED certified projects. How does it work? There is a US Green Building Council that has a rating system called LEED. And there is a green, um, uh, the Green Building uh, um, Institute that has uh, the, that give the accreditation to professionals like myself. We go, we study, we take the exam, we become accredited professional. So they give us the accreditation and they also give the certification for buildings. And this way we don't have uh, the conflict of interest. So the um, entity that owns the rating system is not the same entity that provides certification. 
Um, LEED has a score code for each um, kind of uh, project category. This specific score code is for new construction and major renovation project we can see that the way the green uh, the rating system works is that they look at where is the project located is transportation available in this area or not because we don't want to expand the cities uh, to cover more natural land we want to use the existing developed land as much as possible so when we put the project in a location that is already developed you get points and this is how we score it uh, we can decide from before we start with the project, which how many points we can collect. Um, and we need a total number of points of minimum 40 points to have a certification for the building. Also, it takes into consideration sustainable sites and, and doing different kind of assessments for the site, making sure it's not polluted um, and taking into consideration the sensitivity of the land. Um, also, uh, we take into consideration water efficiency, the energy consumption, materials that we're using, are they locally sourced material, are they uh, green um, uh, certified materials, um, are they uh, like uh, uh, has been manufactured in a sustainable manner and so on. Also indoor environmental quality, innovation, you, you can achieve a total number of points of 110 points for certification. There are different certification levels based on how many points you can achieve uh, from certified to platinum. The certification, there are different kind of certification. You can do combined for design and construction, or you can do a phase uh, certification. You start with design and then after finishing the design, you do another certification for construction. Uh, and it has to be done with having all the teams together, designers, developers, contractors, all on the same page. So no changes in the design or minimal amount of changes in the design can be done later on. Um, I'm just going to show you an example of a project we have in a Liarmouk uh, district in Mosul. Um, it was um, a damaged building uh, because of the, uh, the military uh, uh, operation against, against ISIS. So this building uh, 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 is a project by uh, UN Habitat that we have conducted for them to retrofit the building to become green. Um, and the kind of um, uh, solutions we have incorporated is that we made sure that the building is properly insulated. Um, and this is the energy analysis that you can see for the heating and cooling. We have been able to show in numbers how, uh, and also in heat maps, how much, um, uh, how much energy is going to be saved through the proper insulation only. And that's where we brought the number 88% of energy saving because when we run the two different models together, the conventional building versus uh, the um, the uh, the one that we've designed, uh, we've done the the analysis over and over, and it gave us the same um, numbers. And this is just uh, a, a snapshot or a screenshot of the very first page to compare the conventional uh, building with um, the uh, and you can see here green building design, and this is the conventional design. You can see the amount of um, CO2 emission, how much has been reduced from 66.5 uh, to seven. Also consumption uh, kilowatt hour per square meter from 620 uh, to uh, 70. Uh, so it's a great uh, tool that shows us before we start ahead with the construction is that this building is going to save me this much. Um, and the solutions we have used in terms of like kind of insulated um, uh, envelope, insulated windows, doors, um, whether we are using a, a solar energy system, we did not put it in this uh, analysis. It's also going to be incorporated and it's all going to show us how much um, would be saved. This is um, a retrofitting uh, for green uh, school in Farman Baran in, in Erbil. Um, I'm not going to go through so many details, but I'm just going to show like one of the um, um, 
uh, one of the uh, solutions we use is that we use open grid pavement. Uh, so it, uh, the, the rainwater is going to be absorbed directly to, to the earth. We do not have any flooding or runoff issues. We use solar energy powered LED pulp for the lights out outside during the night. Uh, doesn't consume much energy. We don't need much energy at all, just enough to keep the place lightened and safe. And also we uh, incorporated uh, green roofs that helps us also in, in thermal insulation for the roof, but also provide nice uh, and safe environment for children to play and learn. Um, solar energy panels can be used in any surf service surface that we don't use. For example, we put it on the penthouses on the both sides. We put we put them uh, as um, to cover the um, the um, also the parking lots. Uh, these spaces we don't need them uh, and 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 we don't use them. So uh, uh, it's it's a good way to. Um, to use uh, these spaces. Um, I'm done. Uh, please get in touch with us. I do not want to go through many technical details and be as um, brief as possible. So please, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to um, ask me now or reach out to us. Uh, thank you so much. Can you please leave questions to the end? Sure. Um, next, we have Dr. Um, Melina. Yeah, it's, it's Melina, but Melina is okay as well. <laughs> Hello. So uh, you can jump ahead. Um, yeah. Can you hear me properly with the yes. earphones on? All right. So you can see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Melina Tinacher and I'm very happy to present you today some results of research we added together last year with my colleague or better to say boss Dr. Heike Wendt from the University of Graz in Austria and Dr. Noara Lushin Ebengreuth from the University of Teacher Education in Styria in Austria as well. So the title of my presentation is Chances and Challenges of the Sustainable Development Goals in Education and Analysis of Sustainable and Equitable School Cultures in Austria's Urban Environment. So just a quick overview. I will also talk very shortly only about the SDGs and then about Austria's approach of implementing them into the ed educational system. Then I will present you the research we have done, what was our focus, our instruments, and the results. And in the end, I will discuss the results and also show you the limitations of the study. So we do know all about the SDGs. We have heard a lot about it. Now we have heard about the role of, uh, the very important role of women for reaching the SDGs and also about how important it is to change the way of constructing buildings. And also thank you for that. It was very interesting seeing the screen school in the end. <laughs> um, yeah, so we know the SDGs have the aim to reduce poverty and inequalities, to improve our health and education systems, and to save global resources and our ecosystem. So I will talk now a little bit more about the role of education or a perspective of educational science. So we have the SDG4, which is targeting uh, education specifically, and it's named inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. But if we think about the education system, it is so it's not only about the SDG4, also many other SDGs are finding the way into the education systems. Now the question is, why is it important? It's important because teaching children global values in school in terms of respect for all beings and our ecosystem will create new generations 
more understanding and caring as agents of change. So this is my approach to the implementation of SDGs um, in the educational system. And for our research, we have extracted three dimensions out of the SDGs. We have inclusion, diversity, and sustainability. So during this presentation, when I talk about inclusion now, I will only talk about children with disabilities or special needs. So we didn't take the broader definition because we uh, wanted to make the difference visible to diversity, where I talk about um, diversity in regard of language of different culture, different religious belief, or children and students with a migration of background. And the dimension of sustainability um, means more like environmental education, other topics of the SDGs as peace and health and climate change. <clears throat> So here you can see approaches to the SDG implementation in Austria's educational system. So there is an implementation enacted on a policy level. So the LGBT, what you can see here is a law for equal treatment for everyone. So um, this is also, it doesn't matter if a person has a disability or comes from a different country or religious, has a different religious belief. This law is on a, is a national policy and means equal treatment for everyone. On the dimension of inclusion, we can say we have also signed the UN Convention for the Rights for People with Disabilities. This led in Austria to the National Action Plan um, to increase the quality of inclusive education. And then we also have, um, in relation to sustainability, we have the Austrian Basic Declaration for Education for Sustainable Development. On an instructional level, we can say that most curricula are aligned. So the curriculum of the primary school, a little bit less than in the secondary school, but we find part of the three dimensions. So also of the SDGs in, um, in the, both of the curricula. Um, and we find that in terms of intercultural learning, then we have social learning where students learn to be respectful, tolerant, to reduce their prejudice, then some schools offer mother tongue education for students with a different mother language. And then we find environmental education more or less in a very interdisciplinary approach. So approach, so um, teachers of different subjects also take environmental education into account. Um, on the level of learning environments or school cultures, we can say that there's no monitoring system. So school governance systems partly depend on school autonomy, which means our schools can choose the focus where they want to um, have school development. But educational authorities, they try to govern through institutes and networks. Um, here you can see I've listed some networks, but I think the time is too short to talk about it now. But if some of you are interested, we can talk about it later. But yeah. The the state of the implementation of the SDGs is still unknown because there's no monitoring system. So for me, it became important to find out to what extent the SDGs are implemented in the schools of Graz. And Graz is the second biggest city in Austria. So it's also quite representative for big cities or bigger cities in Austria. And I wanted to find out um, the state of implementation uh, through analyzing the online self-representation of schools, so the school homepages. And then I wanted to find out like how committed are schools in Graz to ensure sustainable, inclusive, and equitable education. And then we also had sub-questions are there relative strengths and weaknesses um, with regard to the three dimensions of activities are school doing? Um, are activities and provisions between the different SDG dimensions related to each other, which school types are more active. So if primary schools, secondary schools, half day schools, all day schools. And then we had a second bigger research question, do urban disparities become apparent? And then we wanted to find out like are there differences in provisions and activities uh, for different urban areas. And and also which school and community characteristics explain higher SDGs. 
So there you can see the main instrument we have been focusing on, and this is more or less the result of using qualitative content analysis. Um, and to study this, I differentiated activities about what you can see, maybe see at the top, uh, inclusion, diversity, and environment, health, and peace, which is standing for the dimension of sustainability. And I considered activities on a structural level, organizational level, school, environmental, and instructional level. And I'm pretty much aware of it that you can't read um, any of this. <laughs> but here you can see my structure, and I ended up having nine scales for the indicators of each dimension, which I considered, and all of them had very nice measurement qualities. And because we have to keep it short, this will be already leading to the, my results. So here you can see the visible activities of schools by sustainability and school development dimensions. We had a sample of, uh, of 98 schools. So the percentage you can also read as number of schools, like more or less. So now we, uh, Austria is in the middle of Europe. And as I've said before, um, inclusion is part of our policies. And here we can see um, on the left, meaning that for inclusion, 42.9% of all schools didn't report anything on their homepage. So nearly half of all the schools didn't even mention inclusion or integrating children with special needs in their school or that they have the provisions or anything else. For diversity, only 24.5% didn't report on any activities or provisions. And for the dimension of safe sustainability, so environment, health, and peace, only 8.2 uh, schools didn't report anything. So here in the middle, you can see um, the activities related to different school development fields. But I want to focus more on the right side, so the linking of activities. So those schools who are doing something um, in terms of inclusion, 52% of the schools, they're just doing like one or two activity. This can mean that a school is um, making publicly visible that the school building is accessible or that they have a teacher for special needs children. But a really a comprehensive concept for really catering for inclusion and having children with disabilities in their school, we could only find uh, at 5.1% of the schools. So maybe five schools in Graz, five schools out of 98 schools seem to have a comprehensive concept. So for diversity, we can see that 59.2 schools um, made some activities, but only 16.3 seem to have a comprehensive concept on that. And in the last dimension for environment, health, and peace, we have found the most comprehensive concept, which, um, which means that the schools are matched indicators, which I've shown you before in the, in the table where you maybe couldn't read anything. Um, so we found the most comprehensive concept for environment, health, and peace. But there is also to say that um, that many schools mention activities like they having a healthy snack, for example, once a week. So eating an apple of a farmer from nearby and they consider it as, um, as, um, as having uh, less waste and having regional food and presenting this as part of the SDGs, but maybe doing it once a week. And on my next slide here, you can see which school factors influence activities. So on the left side, here you can see that the average school in Graz, I'm not sure if you can see where I'm pointing at, but my, I'm at the left top side. So 8.6 uh, activities is the average of activities schools are doing in relation to the SDGs. And now I will only talk about the significant results because otherwise I, I would speak too long. So on the left side at the bottom, you can see that all day schools are having 3.6 so nearly four activities more in relation to the SDGs 
than half day schools have. And now if we are having a closer look on the, on the dimension of inclusion, we can see here that in areas in Graz, in the city, where the proportion of German speaking families in the community is higher, so we have less families with migration background, for example, schools are offering 7.5, so nearly eight activities more in regard to inclusion compared to other areas in the city. Um, although general secondary school, because we differentiate between uh, four years of general secondary school, and we also have uh, eight years of academic higher secondary school leading to graduation in the end. So the general secondary school seems to have 1.6 more activities on average uh, regarding inclusion than academic secondary schools. For the dimension of diversity, we could find out that all day schools also seem to do here a little bit more than half day schools. And having a look on the dimension of sustainability or environment, health, and peace, we, could, we can see here that primary schools are doing on average daily three activities less than secondary schools. Now, putting all these results together, we can say that most schools in Austria offer offer some activities to enact the implementation of the SDGs in their school culture. However, most of the presentation of the SDG related activities and provisions seem to be unsystematic and not coordinated. So we couldn't find many comprehensive concepts on the school homepages. Um, then we found out that schools that have all day education have better conditions for implementation of SDGs. And they also have uh, four, in average, four activities more in relation to the SDGs than half day schools. This is very problematic because this is again leading to structural inequality and does not meet the aim of uh, quality education for all, like the SDG 4 is saying. And then uh, we also found out that networks are supported for the schools for implementing the SDGs, but also not all schools do have the conditions to ensure equal participation and implementation of the SDGs at their schools. And in the end, we can say we also need resources to support schools in the implementation process, but also in the, we need a monitoring process to make efforts visible and acknowledged. And before you are able to mention it, I will do it. So here are the limitations of my study. So the data itself is kind of a limitation because it was uh, content on the school website, so content um, teachers or headmasters uh, put on their school homepage. So there's the question of who has access to change the website, who has access to put new activities on the school homepage. And in regard to the depth of the data, um, so we were not able, probably not able to see daily classes because a teacher is not going home after work and is adding on the school homepage what they have done in a German class today. And also schools are more likely to present special activities like having projects or going on excursions somewhere than putting uh, information about the personnel, so teachers and the staff of the school and changes on organizational level on their school homepage. And yeah, most of these activities didn't take place since the pandemic. And this is already the end of my presentation. I tried to keep it short, but I will end it with a quote because I think um, it's very important. And yeah, unless we begin to engage with the vulnerable to, be, to develop local solutions, the goal of ending poverty for those furthest behind with respect to sustainable development will remain unrealized. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to discuss parts later on. Thank you, Dr. Milena. Thank you so much um, for your uh, presentation. Um, next, we have Dr. Niranga. Uh, is Dr. Niranga here? 
Yes, I am here. Uh, okay, you can you can start ahead. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good evening. I am Niranga Amarasinghe. I, uh, I am an associate professor attached to Sri Lanka Institute of Information and Technology. Uh, I am from engineering background. Uh, I uh, did my uh, bachelor's degree at Sri Lanka uh, in the University of Moratua, and then I moved for the master's degree in Thailand and completed my PhD in the States. My primary field is the traffic engineering. Uh, therefore, the topic which I'm going to discuss today is uh, related to the traffic and the transportation engineering. The topic, as you see here, the development of a sustainable transport system for a developing city. The developing city which I have focused is Colombo city, which is the capital of Sri Lanka. Uh, you can see uh, in this map, uh, uh, the Sri Lanka is here. It is located in the Indian Ocean. It's a uh, South, East, uh, South Asian country. And uh, this is the enlarged version of a country. It is an island. And uh, we have multicultural, multinational uh, people in this country. Uh, when we are going for the topic, as you can see in these pic pictures, in our road system, uh, the traffic is diverse. It is starting from bicycles to large trucks, so we can see on the uh, roads, uh, which is uh, comparatively different uh, for most developing uh, uh, developed countries. Uh, because uh, the developed uh, countries, the driver behavior is much more organized because uh, you might see the vehicles following the lanes, but here all the vehicles is share in the space, not uh, following the lanes. So we have a lot of challenges due to this uh, different uh, vehicle movements uh, because uh, uh, the main problem is the number of vehicles in our cities is increasing rapidly. And the, uh, there are a lot of problems which is uh, connected with the congestion, uh, the congestion level. So that even to go like a few kilometers, this takes uh, hours and hours. The average uh, speed of the vehicles is below 15 kilometers per hour. Uh, therefore, it is a, a timely need to look at these problems and uh, find in a solution. As I mentioned he, uh, earlier, the number of vehicles are increasing day by day. Uh, uh, due to that, uh, we have two main problems. One is the traffic congestions, and the other one is the traffic safety. Uh, the main contribution factors which might be affecting for the urban traffic congestion is the non-working of the single uh, signal light because uh, we might experience a lot of uh, power failure so that uh, most of the times uh, uh, in the peak hours, we could see like the traffic uh, signals are not working. Then what happened is the policemen uh, come into the roads and try to uh, help for the drivers or the traffic uh, by uh, in their level. But uh, we could see the inefficient uh, traffic control uh, doing by them is uh, again uh, make a problem uh, the uh, congestion level uh, is increasing and the excessive number of uh, pedestrian we could see is as a tropical country people uh, uh, would like to uh, uh, walk a lot and also the public transportations are using therefore the number of pedestrians on the road is very high and they are uh, proceeding here and there and uh, many distractions uh, due to the cell phones and other activities are happening uh, uh, while they are crossing the roads. That leads to safety concerns as well. Uh, in addition to that, we could see a lot of reckless and the selfish drivers in road the system. 
uh, therefore uh, we might need to do something uh, in order to uh, reduce the congestion uh, level and also this uh, improve in the level of services and we could also see that the vehicle the frequent vehicle uh, breakdowns in the uh, uh, roads the crashes uh, due to some of the uh, crashes the lot of delays are happening and many other factors also contributing for the uh, congestion level as well when it's come to the traffic safety, uh, the number of crashes are increasing day by day. Uh, but uh, as a developing country, uh, we don't have that much of a, uh, recorded crashes or the mechanism to uh, record uh, uh, accurate data. Therefore, we, um, uh, we don't know much about the uh, uh, safety problem in the country. Uh, what uh, we currently doing is try to uh, understand the problem and we would uh, try to make an integrated traffic management system. That means uh, we, uh, we are counting vehicles and the real time counting in a different locations. And then uh, we try to make a centrally conduct uh, uh, traffic signals and sensors to regulate the traffic uh, to the city with the response as a response demands system. This is a long term project. Uh, anyway, we have started the project now. Uh, also, uh, the uh, safety is, uh, uh, is uh, much more Im uh, uh, important. Uh, traffic safety is much more important uh, in related to the intersection because if you like, look at the crashes uh, in the intersection related crashes, it is uh, as a percentage wise high. For example, uh, in the world, uh, we could see uh, about 1.3 million crashes are occurring each year. In, uh, in this country, in Sri Lanka, it is about 3,000 in each year. Uh, but uh, in USA, the, the number of crashes, which is uh, fatal crashes, which is occurring in the uh, intersection is 28%, and Canada, that percentage is about 30%. Uh, and uh, totally, if you consider the intersection crashes, about 50% of the cr uh, crashes in the United States uh, are occurring in the uh, intersections. And uh, in Japan, it is about 58%. In Sri Lanka, it's not in a whole country, but it has been conducted a small uh, part of the country. Uh, it has been identified. So about 12% of the crashes are uh, occurred in the uh, four-legged intersections, whereas almost 5% of the three uh, crashes are occurred at the three-legged intersections. But as I mentioned earlier, this uh, data is not that much accurate so that we may not be able to make a clear picture on that one. Uh, therefore, when we are developing the integrated management uh, traffic management system, we mainly focus for the intersection improvement and uh, uh, taking into account those uh, uh, values, uh, then we will uh, mainly focus for the traffic uh, control at the intersections. Uh, so that the current investigations can be listed as the developing a traffic count sensor using image processing that we are using the image processing to make this uh, traffic sensor uh, and the traffic management approaches to the micro simulation. Uh, when we are de developing the count uh, traffic sensor, uh, we are using the video scenes that we are uh, getting the video scenes from a camera which is mounted above the roads. And then we will try to isolate the moving objects. That means the vehicles we are getting isolated. And then uh, uh, we are using the features of the vehicles. And then uh, using the features of the vehicles, we can uh, uh, count the number of vehicles uh, based on the type of vehicles. For example, how many cars and how many bicycles, how many uh, buses and so on, we can count. Uh, so that once we get in the count, uh, rather than storing the uh, uh, images or the videos in the uh, system, that we, what we're trying to uh, save the uh, number of uh, vehicles in the system that we are using the Rust Verify uh, board as uh, seen here, and then we will uh, uh, store them in the Raspberry Pi board, and then we try to get those uh, vehicle counts in the central locations. Uh, 
currently we have developed uh, that the uh, uh, algorithm and then uh, we are uh, testing the, uh, uh, the recordings uh, it has been identified we have reached about 90 percent of the accuracy of the data uh, the vehicle uh, counting by type it's a uh, it's a uh, much different uh, the uh, programs in this country because the driver behavior is different therefore we might need to get an extra effort to get these uh, vehicle uh, counts by its type and then uh, we we would uh, once get all those data in the central locations we will uh, develop in the algorithm to analyze the data and then uh, we might uh, select in the optimum design for the intersections not only for the traffic, the pedestrians are also very important as in this country, uh, there are a lot of pedestrians. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a video of a one intersection that you can see many pedestrians are moving uh, or crossing the roads. Uh, therefore, we uh, develop another algorithm to detect the pedestrians that we can detect the pedestrians using the physical count of the uh, images and then uh, and in addition to that we have uh, observed the directions of their travels, not only the uh, uh, crossing pedestrians, we also uh, get the counts of the uh, pedestrians in the walkway, so uh, with their directions, and then we would be able to make a optimized designs for the intersections. And then uh, we are using the micro simulation uh, once we have find it, uh, found out the uh, optimum design that we would uh, simulate the traffic uh, using the uh, simulation software, we are using a commercial uh, simulation software for this purpose. Uh, what we have to do is we have to, first of all, we are uh, the uh, commercial uh, 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 commercial uh, uh, simulation uh, software has been developed in a uh, developed country where uh, uh, they are the traffic uh, level is homogeneous that uh, mostly the, la the vehicles are following the uh, lanes and so on that cannot be directly used for the countries like Sri Lanka. First of all what we have done is we have calibrate the software for a local conditions uh, uh, that is needed because the driver behavior is different in this country compared to the developed countries and then once we have uh, uh, developed uh, calibrated the software uh, we are collecting the geometric data and then also the traffic data in order to make the simulation models uh, you have seen in the uh, right side video that is the simulation model uh, uh, as it is running so that uh, what we do is uh, we will uh, uh, compare the uh, uh, different uh, uh, optimized design and we can select the best design by change the geometry of the uh, intersections and also the change in the traffic management approaches. For example, we might uh, change the uh, single timing and then we, uh, we could uh, find the best uh, design for the intersections. Uh, with that one, uh, we uh, we could uh, uh, imp uh, make a uh, improved liability and workability in a sustainable city. The the system which we are. Uh, first of all which we are going to test for a small soon and then we will go for a, the other zones and uh, uh, try to replicate in the other zone so that we would be able to have a centralized uh, control traffic management system and uh, that uh, once the simulation software has been uh, calibrated that we could uh, get the uh, good uh, management uh, solution and also we could uh, further improve the system using the adaptive uh, traffic signals, autonomous vehicles uh, and real-time uh, traffic field best, uh, also the tracking pedestrian traffic towards the smart cities. Uh, we uh, for this project we are closely uh, collaborated with the uh, traffic uh, police and the uh, local uh, road development authority in order to have a best design for uh, towards the uh, sustainable city.
we have also received funding for this project from the World Bank. Uh, and uh, I uh, thank you all for giving this opportunity to uh, share our project uh, with you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. N uh, Niranga. That was uh, extremely uh, informative. We have next uh, in line, Dr. Fuad. Is Dr. Fuad uh, ready? Yes, I am. Hello, Dr. Thank you, Swas. Please go ahead now, it's your turn. Um, well, I need to share because I, there's needs to be stopped by previous presenter. You, you, can, uh, you can try I now. I can continue, yeah, okay. Perfect. Very good. Okay. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here in this uh, forum. I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, forum, especially Dr. Suha, Dr. Malan, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, my presentation is about um, curricula and teaching of design topics at universities. My name is uh, Fouad Khoshnaw. Uh, I think it is a good idea to give you a bit about my background because it is somehow related to what I'm talking in this presentation. Um, you'll see the link uh, between the presentation and what's going on in my background. So I worked at uh, different universities in Iraq and Kurdistan my background is mechanical engineering. I taught design topics or design modules in uh, different levels, undergraduate and postgraduate. And also at the moment, I'm uh, teaching at De Montfort University in the United Kingdom. Also the modules that are related to uh, design engineering. So what I wanted to show in this presentation uh, was the, to find out how the curriculum and delivering system or delivering methods of teaching to the students will affect uh, at the end on the graduate employment, how we can teach design topics and how does that affect on uh, the um, disability to uh, arrange their future uh, jobs. That's my email in case if anyone interested in this presentation or other topics. So the objective of that, based on what I said just now about uh, teaching design topics, which uh, at Salahadin University in Hauler, I taught for eight years design modules in mechanical engineering. The same thing at Koei University, I was professor uh, in Koya University and as well as the Dean of Faculty of Engineering. So I had a chance to review the curriculum of seven departments. So I realized how the reviewing curriculum between time to time will affect the employability uh, of the graduates. Different approach has been applied for uh, how do you teach design topics? Um, usually what I taught in different ways uh, before and now. So sometimes you will get a textbook, thousand pages, you have to finish that in uh, one year. And so it is like a blocked opportunities for you and the students to follow exactly what's written in that textbook. However, design, uh, delivering design topics or design modules, it should give full flexibility to the students to choose what they want to decide and to decide also what they want to, because that will give them the uh, opportunity to be innovative and creative about what they are thinking of. 
instead of blocking them, giving them a frame, what do you have to do and what you should not do? So the ways of teaching and delivering methods that they're the students to have their own imagination and innovation instead of having a textbook, that's the book we need to follow it. And that's also should be related to the market research methods. So that's part of the student's uh, task uh, during while he's uh, studying design because he has chosen whatever department, mechanical, architecture, uh, chemical engineering, whatever. So that means the students already in the beginning recognize that he or she will study design. So we have to give them, the students, opportunity to go on their own thinking, uh, to deep consideration about what's the market needs, what's the customer needs. So this uh, interaction, increasing the interaction level between the designer or the student or the graduate with the customer will find out for the students what's the market needs. What do we need to follow in, uh, uh, as a need of uh, uh, the, the market? So what's going on in this presentation? I will try to find out what is design, how people think in different ways about the meaning of design. How do you start the design? Roads and resources, how do you find the, the solutions for the problem? Customer requirements, that's uh, really, I, I like to focus on that. Design specification, what do you need? Codes and standards, evaluation, prototype, and testing. So that's the proper way of how you can start and end any design. What's a design? Different opinions about design, uh, what's that? Uh, different definitions, so someone's in very simple ways, say it is drawing, it is planning, it's building a concept, it's a virtual idea so someone can think about it, or uh, it is human decision about some any problem or uh, needs. It's innovation, it is making things or manufacturing different. But these are all, all true, nothing wrong with them. But the, the actual, uh, the actual definition that covers all of these is design is a process. We need to start with one of the first step and ends with the, with the last one. So it is a process. And how this process starts, especially with uh, delivering and teaching students at universities, that should give the flexibility from the beginning to the students to choose what they want to do, what they want to design, Instead of giving them a specific task, that's your task, you should follow, to follow these steps. So for, for example, at the moment, I teach engineering design model. Uh, it covers like 12 to 15 weeks, uh, including exams and assignments. So I can divide it into five steps, major steps. So it is a process, it's a road you need to follow. The first step is what's the customer needs? Where is the problem? We, we need to have a problem definition. If there is no problem, why do you do the, the, the design then? What's the difference between what it is already available and what uh, the th student or any other designer needs to make a difference? So customer needs and problem definition. That's the first step. Why do you need to make this design? Then find out by brainstorming design solutions and prepare specification. What is the difference between what you need to design and with the other existing uh, items or products? That's come by searching, by looking at previous solutions, but uh, mainly, we, uh, as I said, we need to give the full flexibility to the students without any restriction to think as far as they need. That will give a chance to be creative for uh, and the students. Then we come back to preliminary and detailed design. That's what 
actually in many uh, curriculum they do, so only calculations. There is a shaft, there is a beam, there is a chemical plant, put calculations. But we, we shouldn't forget the first two steps and the other steps. So this calculation already there, we need to follow the standards and review time by time to improve it. And then we come back to the customer to show that's the design, what do you need to change? This loop between the beginning, what the customer needs, and then after design, coming back to the customer again to see what needs to be changed. Is the customer happy? That's important step. So first step, define the problem to generate a solution to the problem. A clear definition of the problem is re, uh, and it is required. Where is the problem? Similar to any other research, uh, uh, it should be there is a problem to, to do the research to uh, as an attempt, as a trial to solve it. Who does need it? Where is the customer? So have you searched the market needs? Is the market needs this product or item? Uh, what are the requirements? Why do you need that? Why do they need the new one? Uh, this can be part of the student's task. They go to the, to the streets, to the market, do questionnaire, do interview, do focus group, what the market needs. And they can bring these ideas to the universities to make these things. And this in the future will give them opportunity for employability. And this will reduce the pressure on the governments to give everyone a graduate a job. Instead, they can build their own jobs based on what they have learned from uh, during their studying at universities. And then writing, how do you write? That's uh, essential step. How do you write a, a design brief? Where is the problem? Who is the customer? What are the specifications? Research, so after problem definition, we need to find out uh, what are the, are there any solutions already in hand? And what do you need to change to make a difference and uh, get uh, customers in the market to, to buy it? How effective are the current solutions to the problem? needs to uh, consider the cost-effective manufacturability, market competition. Who, who is your, your competitor in, in the market? Are they stronger, weaker than your, uh, 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 let's say, resources that you have? So specifications, so many things the students can cover from size, weight, uh, till the documents, patent, shipping, uh, quality, documentation, maintenance. Every product have some essential aspects the students can focus on it. So not necessary that all aspects that's written here, uh, or can uh, we can say it here, uh, will be considered by any design. Some of them may be with one product, but some others uh, needed for other products. So, but these are all needs to be considered by the lecturer who is teaching, delivering, and uh, the student. So give the student opportunity to think in very deep ways how the design can be related to any of these aspects. So that's the one of the books that I follow. It's showing how the engineering design methods can follow with this step-by-step uh, uh, -step methods. Generate solutions, so brainstorming and mind mapping for creating the ideas. A number of good solutions can be in hand. That can be done through replacement. So you replace one part uh, then the existing one. Elimination, you think that the, the existing product, no need for all these uh, parts, so you can eliminate one or remove one, that will be new product. New materials, you can think the mechanism can be changed. The energy, especially with these days, everyone 
looking for a friendly environment and uh, resources. So I think every, every change in the product makes something new. That's the thing uh, most of the universities, they focus on it during um, design. So calculations, long calculations, derivations of equations, that is not part of design. These all topics can be covered in other relevant topics that's going in parallel with design module. Manufacturing materials, these are all other modules the students will take it in previous years or on the same year that the student taking engineering design modules. So no need to repeat that uh, in design uh, topics. Instead, in design module, the students should be focused only on creating idea to be in, in, innovative and creative. No need to go with very deep complicated equations because there are other modules covering that uh, aspects. Test and evaluate if there is a chance to make the, to, to build or manufacture the product, that will be good. So you need to test it as a prototype, then evaluate uh, if you have different ideas. So uh, to all, there are different methods to evaluate the products together to see which one is the best one to be used. So again, uh, design is a process. Uh, uh, we start with the customer and we end with the customer because the customer is, should be the, the main, the main uh, axis of uh, designing any product. There should be a problem, there should be a customer uh, based on the questionnaire and group focus that the students or any other designer can do. And in between, there are uh, finding uh, solutions, calculations, manufacturability, uh, and so on. So recommendations for based on what I've got, uh, highlight the market requirements in the curriculum of design topics to focus on the customer needs through uh, making a questionnaire and interview. That's a major point we need to send our students to the market uh, to interview people. What do they need? Which product they, do they need? And during their uh, studying, they will get benefit from that. And after graduation, they might have a chance to build their business based on what they have learned from designing. Flexibility needs to be given to the students to choose products. So, uh, some students, they have their own hobbies and interests. So let them, they do that instead of fixing their uh, uh, chances in specific products. Teaching design topics needs to be focused on creating ideas and building innovation methods, not <laughs> derivation of long equations that can be taught in relevant Design modules need to be tailored with the curriculum in the curriculum. So reviewing curriculum uh, is important. And this can be done in even in secondary schools, very simple uh, steps in years eight and 10, then in uh, level one or year one in at the university, then uh, slowly going on. But these are all the principle of how do you deliver the design topics. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope I have been in the right time. Thank you so much, Dr. Fouad. Uh, I think we're, we have uh, maintained the perfect timing uh, for each presentation. Our last but not least, Dr. Nahad. Dr. Nahad is here. Yes. Hello, everybody. Hello, Dr. Nahad. Yeah. You can, you can start with your presentation. Yeah, I try to share my presentation. Just need acceptance from the admin. You'll be able to do that now because Dr. Fuad has turned off uh, his uh, screen sharing.
do I need to click on the share screen back or it will be okay? Yeah. Dr. Fuad should uh, being... Uh, uh, Dr. Fuad has turned off his uh, screen sharing. We don't see his screen anymore. So uh, you can uh, you can share now, Dr. Nahad. Yeah. Yes. Now, is it clear for you, Dr. Abbasima and others? It is clear. Yeah, thank you. So good evening uh, for all. Masa al khair and Shababash for Bohingo. So, uh, may I present myself? This is uh, Dr. Anohad Al Omari at Rushi. Uh, I have uh, B Farm, Bachelor of Pharmacy, and uh, uh, MSc and PhD in Medicinal Chemistry. Uh, now, I have my affiliation with the College of Pharmacy Knowledge University in Erbil, KRG. Uh, well, uh, today I will discuss uh, with you uh, my experience, my passion, my experience, and continue work at the uh, front phone by overcoming dark ages of occupation, uh, which is educational crisis. Uh, as I was uh, former acting Dean College of Pharmacy, University of Mosul, uh, at, uh, from 2014 to 2017, and then former Dean College of Pharmacy, Al Kitab University, Al Tonkobri Karkuk, 2017 to 2020. Now I am responsible for Scientific Affairs, College of Pharmacy, Knowledge University, Erbil. So the speech will involve overcome dark age occupation, educational crisis, uh, historical challenges in modern history uh, at University of Mosul, Al-Kitab University, Kirkuk, uh, from 2014 to 2020. Uh, well, the reality of this location uh, at this period of time taken uh, uh, as umbrella of science, various ethical group, but one science language. Uh, it is internally displaced student uh, of uh, every ethnic and religion communities in Iraq. And uh, how we generate hope and uh, urgency in building academic communities at challenge period of time that uh, empower displaced students, whether uh, undergraduate or postgraduate, to continue their learning with hope and uh, ambitiousness in uh, re-establish universities. So that uh, in spite of destroying the Iraqi unicorn, but didn't destroy the unicorn uh, inside our uh, heart. Uh, and then uh, networking, what uh, we work for networking and uh, uh, international awards, memberships, IMS Dean Forum, uh, Gulf uh, ISB of uh, selenium sulfur reduction catalyst and Royal Pharmaceutical Society at recently established university at Al Kitab and then at Knowledge. So uh, mostly the historical challenges uh, will be uh, divided into two uh, periods of time. When I was uh, acting in, uh, at University of Mosul at uh, occupation uh, by uh, ISS uh, from 2014 to 2017, uh, I try to uh, cover the uh, overcoming dark age occupation uh, by continuing uh, final exams since that uh, period of time, it was uh, uh, the uh, period of final exam, which is not stopped because of uh, invasion by uh, ISS, uh, which need to urgent demand uh, for uh, continuing uh, this final exam. 
and then by re-establishment of dislocated University of Mosul uh, after that, 2015, and then for two following uh, years. Uh, at the same time, uh, after resigning from uh, University of Mosul, I transferred to uh, University of Al-Kitab. Uh, I was Dean College of Pharmacy. And at that time, you know, it was recently established and we need to putting pharmacy at the front front of education at Al-Kitab. Uh, it was story of challenges as I uh, show you in the following slide. And then uh, recently I was uh, uh, assigned as a scientific affair for College of Pharmacy and Knowledge University. So, challenges for the uh, educational field faced challenges in uh, parallel to the healthcare, uh, healthcare field. Now, actually this presentation uh, was uh, already delivered to the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. I was a plenary speaker and there was uh, an example of uh, women who overcome the obstacle and challenges in very hard uh, period of time. And uh, one of country which supposed to be the hardest uh, country all over the world. So uh, during this period of time, I shall mention some of obstacles and difficulties and how uh, we try to overcome of it. So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, oh, uh, if you look to this uh, picture, uh, can you identify what does it mean for you? Actually, uh, one cannot image uh, what this may explain just to show you the serious and uh, very hard situation that we was at that time of period so anyone guess what is this picture does it mean for you actually this is the ash of burned books of one of the finest institution of higher learning in Iraq. It was University of Mosul. And uh, if some of you have no idea about the location of, uh, uni uh, of Mosul and specifically University of Mosul, it's actually uh, lies on the Northwest of Iraq, and uh, uh, this was the location of uh, University of Mosul. So uh, many historical changes in modern history we faced by overcoming dark ages. And uh, 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 continuing, as I mentioned, continue final exam. This was urgent demand at that time. And after that, we uh, try to reestablish for the dislocated University of Mosul. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, for the uh, College of Pharmacy, uh, University of Kitab also considered to be one of uh, big challenges for me, uh, since it's uh, located in the conflict zone between uh, KRG, Kurdistan, and two different uh, policy. Uh, whether KRG and uh, Baghdad govern it. So at that time, let us start with the challenges with the uh, dislocation, uh, the reality of dislocation and what the action have been taken for us. First of all, the urgent demand for the continued final exam uh, for uh, especially for undergraduate student, the number of uh, number was unproportioned with the academic staff number because just third of the uh, real academic staff dislocated, while the two third uh, actually stay in Mosul. So the action taken is to ask uh, the help 
uh, and academic staff from uh, Kurdistan region government at that time, university, whether uh, Duhok, uh, Erbil, and uh, Suleimani. And actually, we are very grateful for uh, KRG for their kind uh, cooperation and uh, support at that time. And uh, usually not all lecture materials are available at that time and no exams question bank, but again, limited resource or not at all to be taken action from original staff, which as I said, stay in Mosul. And that's why we ask for uh, volunteers. Uh, academic staff under occupation, they're under a threatened life, uh, with their families, so no blame, and we are uh, they are looking for uh, just survive. So the academic worries, heroes, rare, and uh, same volunteers. For the examination center, it's limited uh, again, no uh, place for university, and we, uh, but uh, you know, uh, it was a good time that we are. Uh, highly welcome uh, from University of Duhok, uh, uh, Erbil, and Suleimaniya. So always we have alternative centers, Duhok, Erbil, Suleimaniya, Karkuk, and Baghdad. Uh, for the correction of answer sheet, again, it's a big challenge at that time, and that we try to correction of well-monitored scanned uh, answer sheet no salary for first three months. Uh, so mostly they are struggle uh, for uh, economic crisis also. Uh, again, the postgraduate studies continues final exam with no supervisor and no bench for working. That's why we ask him for a mutual co-supervisor from KRG Baghdad Karkuk. And uh, uh, this is some picture uh, 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 explained the situation, the education crisis at that time. But uh, again, by cooperation, by good support from uh, University of uh, KRG, Baghdad, Karkuk, uh, we could overcome all. So we have alternative uh, a place for the first time, whether in Kirkuk or Duhok and others. The other challenge is to how to re-establishment of dislocated uh, University of Mosul. That uh, because re-establishing, meaning that uh, uh, need a larger uh, area than what we needed for a uh, continual final exam. So there were limited halls, limited labs, shortage of equipments and chemicals, shortage of academic staff, academic staff out of Kirkuk and in addition to administrative issues. So each obstacle we try to find limited hall, as a college of pharmacy, we were dislocated and reestablished at the College of Dentistry, University of Kirkuk. For the limited labs, actually, we used uh, labs of other college like veterinary. We shared together for the equipment and chemicals, uh, try to supply and furniture urgently. For shortage of academic staff, again, we asking visiting lectures from. Uh, other university for academic staff uh, who uh, they are out of Kirkuk, you know, they're traveling each day from KRG. You suppose the Hawk, for example, uh, you, you need four hours to reach to uh, Kirkuk. And uh, for Suleimani and Erbil, it was uh, mostly three days per week. And for administrative issues, uh, usually we have affiliation at Kirkuk and Duhok government. For the reclaim of Iraq's Mosul University from uh, under the ashes, 
uh, as uh, uh, Los Angeles Times stated 2017's the women drug the price and furniture uh, Abdul Majid helped lug a large table towards the window where men heaved the object out the windows five stories up. The process often finished with the loud thud. The sound was jarring and eerie silence hangs over the compass that once serves 30 thousand students one day. And 75% of university electrical system was damaged, as well as 45% of its water system. Hundreds of university owned vehicle were taken by uh, and more than 1 million books burned according to Kamaluddin. The year long repair works primarily conducted by the UNDP with support from the Iraqi government has reduced the scale of damage from 70 to 27%, as he added. But as you see from this bright picture that we uh, actually did uh, a lot of uh, accomplishment and uh, jumping uh, over a lot of uh, uh, obstacles and difficulties at that time and we try to uh, graduate the batch of uh, undergraduate actually there were uh, more than uh, three three batches and uh, the fourth was uh, for that they continue the final exam I think I have, uh, yeah, for the postgraduate again, we have Viva postgraduate in dislocated places, whether for MSc and PhD during dislocation and uh, graduation for the first building units of medical care safety. Uh, this is one of uh, my batches who graduated 2016, 2017. Now coming to the uh, challenges faced uh, as a Dinari uh, uh, College of Pharmacy, Al-Kitab University, uh, this is the region, the conflict uh, region uh, for Al-Kitab University for period 2017 to 2020, uh, Al-Kitab University who uh, located at uh, Alton Kobri, uh, related to Kirkuk provenance. Again, challenges, and we have action to be taken uh, as a challenge is recently established uh, College of Pharmacy, meaning that establishing a new academic guideline. Uh, as I mentioned, it was a conflict zone. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, obstacle, mainly the broken bridge of Alton Kobri, sometimes cannot overcome. It is intolerant situation. As you know, it is a private, uh, but not public, and meaning that uh, financially support. The ethnic group of uh, College of Pharmacy, since it's located at Kirkuk, uh, so we, saw, uh, we have multi religions and language is considered to be. Uh, reflected to many uh, Iraq. At the same time, the action is gathering with science umbrella rather than other ethics. So English as the scientific language, uh, the most obstacle that faced at that time is multi-checkpoint that need to come early, uh, which is again uh, intolerated. So this is the daily on way to uh, Al-Kitab University, broken bridge of Alton Kobri, because it is conflict zone between uh, two uh, government, KRG, and uh, uh, which is uh, suffer from inconvenience security uh, situation. And uh, you may realize from these photos how much it is uh, intolerated for multi checkpoints. But again, some of uh, national and international student activities 
which was under always umbrella of science. We did a good job uh, and sharing uh, thoughts, idea with the uh, national and international organization. And uh, our uh, students wearing uh, a good activity at that time. We have a lot of activities. We have our uh, newspaper specifically for students sharing our idea with the international and having many uh, activities uh, inside the uh, College of Pharmacy. Uh, again, networking uh, with international awards uh, for uh, as a uh, international uh, uh, WIPO, which is World Intellectual Property Organization, awarded many times internationally. I was a, a, as a AIMS member and uh, Royal Pharmaceutical Society member. And uh, lastly, as uh, International Scientific Board of Selenium and Sulfur Reduction Catalase uh, uh, Group. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, because we have uh, uh, always have slogan that to be positive, so the umbrella uh, of science that uh, gathering uh, various ethical groups, but it was one science language. The policy that cannot gather all these ethic in one umbrella, we can do it by umbrella of science. And uh, we looking for the board that always there were positive outcomes. So destroying the Iraqi unicorn, they didn't destroy the unicorn inside our hearts. So my greetings and my uh, student uh, greeting to the dear delegate of uh, WISP 21st, uh, and thank you for you all. Uh, any question? Thank you, Dr. Nihad, this was inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to all the audience, if you have any questions to panelists, uh, please feel free to direct. I just, uh, Dr. Abbas, if you forgive me, I just want to deliver my great thanks for uh, Dr. Amal and Dr. Sohar for the, their kind invitation to sharing my uh, experience and uh, how we uh, skip all these uh, obstacles and challenges. Thank you for your all for your kind attention. Thank you for the organizers, for Dr. Amel, uh, Dr. Sohad, and Dr. Ahmed. Um, it was a great pleasure to be here today. Please feel free uh, to all the audience, feel free to direct questions um, to us uh, through the organizers or to look up our names and uh, reach out to us uh, on social media. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. Um, if there is nothing else to say, we can wrap up the session. It was an honor for me to be uh, among such amazing selection of uh, professionals. Um, so I think we can wrap up. Um, thanks, thanks to everyone and have a wonderful uh, day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. George Bass. I think um, we need to take um, a picture together before before you wrapping up the session, Dr. Basima. Sure, Dr. Ahmed. I don't have a, a PhD. <laughs> uh, I just have a master's degree. And um, but uh, thank you all. Uh, definitely, we can take a picture if everyone can uh, turn their um, videos on and uh
Dr. Ahmed, you 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 can you feel free and take a, a picture whenever you. Oh, okay. So um, may I ask the panelists to turn their camera on, please? So we are gonna to take um, um, a picture together for um, um, to memorize this um, event and this session. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. All done from my side. Thank you. Bye-bye.